Hi YouTube, I'm Ali, welcome back to the channel. I'm super excited today, I'm always super excited, but today especially so because it's my second interview with a game designer, someone who's taken a product, an idea, sorry, all the way through to a published product. Now, if you haven't seen the first interview I did with Adam Zwayne, you can catch that on the little cards linked above. I don't know which side it is, I can never remember. I really should do that by now. But anyway, uh, if you haven't done that, that's cool. Come back to it later because today we're speaking with a new guy called Zintis May who's produced a game called Cave Paintings. Right, before we start though, a couple of things. Firstly, my obligatory ask for subscriptions, which is going to follow now. Okay, and now the second bit, which is just to state once again, the quality of this isn't great. Um, I've used Skype once again to try to capture uh, an interview with Zintis. He was super busy and I really appreciate the time he gave me to go through his process and his ideas uh, on how he got his game Cave Paintings up and running. Um, oh, pardon me. To start with though, I think we need to do a little introduction. So of course I asked the obvious questions of Zintis. Who the hell are you? Uh, how did you get into game design? And this is what he responded with. Uh, my name is Adis May, and I'm a game designer from New Jersey, and I've lived in New Jersey and PA all my life um, in America. And uh, I've always loved games. So, like, when I was young, when I was, like, um, in late grade school and middle school, I was playing, like, Magic and a little bit of Warhammer. Um, in high school and college, I learned how to play poker, um, a little bit of StarCraft in my 20s, and more recently, I've been getting into this hobby board game thing. And I've really enjoyed it so far because a lot of the games are really interesting in how they work. Um, there's a lot of variety, there's a lot of different games, and a lot of games have a lot of depth, and I can really just like get into it and, and like figure out how these games are working because I find that interesting. So as far as game design goes, um, I, rem I had this memory of like when I was like 10 or something, be like, I want to design a game. And then as soon as I like started writing down like the first three lines, I'm like, this is going to take a long time, and I'm not ready for it. So I like I, I remember that like years and years later. But what ended up happening is that in 2011, um, I had like stumbled across a couple of podcasts. Uh, I think it was like Ludology and Game Design Roundtable, and found that I had like a passing interest in, in game design. I found it I found it interesting. So um, I thought that maybe at some point I would study a little bit of game design, study a little bit of programming, and then like one day I would make a game, just like you know, just for the fun of it. But what ended up happening was that the learning uh, learning programming ended up staying completely separate from the game design. So now I'm a web developer and I do game design uh, on nights and weekends, um, sure. which is just kind of how that happened. Um, that really started. So I like had a passing interest in 2011. I studied it for like a year or two while I was working. In 2014, I had a little bit of time to myself, so like I really started to get into it. And in 20, let's see, 2015, 2016. I really started to like attend design meetups as regularly as possible, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, oh, in wow. twenty, okay. yeah, uh, in twenty seventeen, I got a game signed. In twenty eighteen, I got a game published. Um, it's called Cave Paintings, yes. and I have a bunch of other designs that are still looking for homes. But like, that's probably my my greatest success so far, and I'm still very active in the community. In fact, last weekend I went to uh, Metatopia, which is a game design convention near my uh, uh, near my hometown. So it's in in St. Morristown. It's really great if you have a chance to go to it. So with small talk and introductions over and done with, I was keen to understand where Cave Paintings came from. What was its origin story? Now, I was expecting to follow this up with my killer question of what was more important? What came first? Was it the mechanics or the theme? But what Zintis said really stopped me in my tracks. It was really quite interesting. Around Christmas time, 2015, 2016, early 2016, and... We were playing uh, Jackbox Party Pack, which is a, a game on uh, on you can play on um, I think it was PS4. You can play on the TV, and everyone would use their phones and like go in and participate in the game. And one of the games was a drawing game. So I drew, everyone had fat fingers and drew horrible pictures of who knows what. But like somehow I managed to draw a pretty reasonable shot of a guy wearing glasses, and everybody knew immediately guy sure. wearing glasses. And that experience, like just being in the room and everyone being like, ah, oh, that's a guy with glasses. I realized that. That wasn't funny. That wasn't fun having the good drawing in the drawing game. Like all everybody else's like monstrosities and horrible dogs and, and helicopters. Absolutely. That was funny. And it was like in that experience, I realized that like, like why don't more drawing games try to make it so that that like bad drawings are good, like are good for the game. 
So what ended up happening was that I kind of pondered this idea, and this is, I guess, the third way to make a game. So one is theme first, one is mechanics first, and then the third one, I guess, would be like experience first. So you're like sure. trying to make or cultivate a player experience. Now, this statement about player experience blew my mind. I think what Zintas was saying here was that actually mechanics and theme came second to him. What he wanted to do was ensure that they felt what they, the players that is, felt what he wanted them to feel. They, they would go on the journey that Zintas wanted to take them on. And, and this was really exciting to me. It was a different way of looking at how I could shape my initial idea. Of course, I asked him to elucidate and give me a little bit more information for me to work with. A couple years ago, I, I would have really hated using the words player experience because I feel it's like very nebulous. Like, sure. you know, like what is a play experience? What is a, a user experience? But uh, the idea is that you want to have a situation where people are around a table and they're drawing and they look at each other's horrible drawings and laugh. And that's kind of like what I was going for with, with cave paintings. So it started with that. And I started about to think about ways to mechanically make players do the thing I wanted to do. Because ultimately, all games are mechanics. They're built with mechanics. Sure. Theme is great, and you can build towards theme, but you can't play a theme. Playing a theme is like reading a book, basically. Books are all theme. So, and a game is mechanics. I was like, how do I make players uh, draw poorly? So I'm like, I could have a time limit. Sure, I could make people draw on a time limit. And I could make them draw a lot of drawings in a very short amount of time. Um, maybe they won't be able to erase. So now if they make a mistake, they're stuck with it. And then I had this this last idea, which is the one that's probably most prevalent in cave paintings, is that you have to hold the pen like this. And I this is like a thing that five year olds do. So it's I don't I don't want to say that it's revolutionary or anything, but what it does do is that it makes that people who are very good artists cannot use their fine motor skills to make drawings. Um, everyone's forced to do this very ham-fisted approach. And you'd be surprised that like people who are bad at drawing don't really draw worse this way than they do this way. It's just because either way, they don't have much practice, so they're drawing at about the same pace. And what I found when I when I brought to the table was that like it it came across pretty quickly. Like those those concepts of like, I want to make people draw badly, and then I want to make people guess each other's bad drawings like almost instantly translated into a pretty playable game. With the initial idea now understood and the player expectation or the player experience rather being used to shape the initial idea, I was keen to understand how Zintas would develop it further. What was his approach? So personally, um, I tend to go big and then cut down. Other designers will like try to try to make the perfect nugget of a game and then build out. And I think both approaches have, have a reason to be used and it depends who you are. So. Um, with cave paintings in particular, um, I like had, so like other, uh, that's not a, like most of my games, I'm, I go big. I like put down all my ideas in one game. I see what sticks to the wall. Everything that doesn't work gets cut out. Um, with cave paintings, like I wasn't sure what would work. I wasn't sure anything was going to work. So like, but once I put it on the table, I was able to observe the players and see how they're interacting with the game and with each other. And over time, you could be like, oh, there's a little bit of too much downtime here. I should make them do something. Or, oh, maybe everyone can draw at the same time. Or maybe everyone can guess at the same time. And like, basically, you're kind of trying to, you're working with the players to try to figure out what's going to make them have the most fun. Um, or, or teach them something. Or be interesting in some fashion. Like, you're trying to make it so that their experience is good. And with, so this came over, over, over the course of a lot of different play tests. I was able to observe people playing and make changes and then observe what the changes did. Um, so like I didn't come into it being like, ah, oh, I'm a genius. I have the perfect idea. I know exactly what will make people happy. That didn't, that didn't happen. Um, because I don't know, like I have a brain so I can have like, I can kind of figure out what's happening in other people's brains. But at the same time, I don't necessarily know what you find fun what parts of it you find fun, what things will be challenging, what things will be too easy. So it's important to play test so you can not validate, but so you can observe how your game is received by the people who will be playing it. Um, and that's very important. So I, I'd highly recommend putting it out there and play testing as soon as you can, because that way you know, like you know, know that your game went over well, your changes were good, that kind of thing. 
So clearly, playtesting is a critical part of the whole process. I think that's pretty obvious. In fact, it's such a big part that I feel I should really do it justice in a separate set of videos. For now then, I'm gonna jump over the idea of playtesting albeit recognizing it's really important and helps shape that initial idea, but I'm gonna jump over and zone in on one particular aspect that Zentis mentioned, which is really about sharing the idea in the first place. Now, I've had this bizarre, bizarre fear that I don't want to share my ideas out too quickly. But speaking with Adam and again speaking with Zintis, I get the feeling that really I should be sharing my ideas because I'm gonna get better feedback. I, I touched upon this with Zintis and asked for a little bit more of his guidance around what the approach should be with sharing your idea. So like when I was a beginning designer and I just had like started working the process, um, a good way to describe it is that like in the beginning, you've only ever gotten this far. And then after a while, you've eventually gotten this far. Maybe you have a playable game that people like to play. Then maybe you get to the part where you're pitching and then maybe you get to the end where like a game has been picked up and published. But in the beginning, designers the most progress that they've ever made is like having an idea and trying to execute on it. So like that thing that they've made there in that tiny span of time is like the most precious thing that they've made so far in their design career. But as you continue the process, you realize that like, oh, once I have this most precious thing, I thought, I'm actually only a quarter of the way done. So like um, game, game theft, I think is very rare. Because if someone was to like walk over, see you guys play testing a game, write down some notes and copy it, copy the game exactly, they don't have a game yet. Once the publisher's done with it, you have a game. At that point, you have an idea and a concept, but when they take that game from you, they don't have a game, they have your problem. They have the exact same problem that you have at that moment, which is like, you still need more development, you still need to start pitching, you still need to find a publisher. So like, they are, sure, maybe they're a little bit further ahead than they would have been if they started from a dead stop, but, they're still like they still just started the race. They're not right, right. didn't get that far. Gotcha. Um, and one one quick story is that um, uh, maybe a year or two ago, I had an idea for a, a game that uses um, books. Uh, like so, like Gloomhaven has these maps, um, and they're hard to put out, and it's really annoying, in my opinion. And so there's games like uh, Near and Far that uses a book to create the the player board. So I figured that like, hey, you can make a game that has like a book, and then like maybe another book, and combined they just make a player map and you'd be done so like i want to set up this map boom boom page 23 page 24 map is There's set up map. so nice. i i talked to some designers and i pitched them this idea and like i was kind of like i wanted to make a game with it but like i was wasn't getting anywhere and but by sharing it one of my uh one of my game design friends tam yang was like oh that'd be really cool i'm gonna make a game that uses that uses books and you're gonna have this like legacy game and story and he just took that idea and ran with it and has a very excellent prototype right now that i think should get i think is probably gonna picked up in the next year or so as he goes to conventions um because he made he took my idea which was like a lot of work and kind of a big problem just hanging over me and then he like just made this pretty awesome little light RPG out of it. And I'm, I'm really happy for that because it means that like my idea, which is useless to me, has been very useful to him. And that was because I shared it, not because I sat on it like a dragon hoarding gold. So now I took two things away from that. Firstly, what a great philosophy. The idea of being able to share with a community and see an idea that you had go to fruition with another designer. Perfect. That's really good. That's something I think I would embrace. But the second point that I think was underlying that was the fact that Zintus knew that that wasn't his only idea. It may have been special to him at one stage, but actually he's probably going to generate hundreds of ideas over the course of his life. And in fact, I suspect I will and you will too as a budding game designer. So that really empowered me to think I shouldn't perhaps be too precious with my ideas because I'm going to have plenty of them. Maybe I should be sharing my ideas because I'm going to get feedback and someone else might benefit from a solution to a problem they're currently suffering. In the, in the end, it all helps the community and it makes all of our games better. In fact, that's something that he echoes um, as an answer in the last question I ask him. We've been chatting for about half an hour by this time, uh, and although I've cut out a lot of that because I wanted to zone in on those specific points that we've covered today, um, I did ask that question, that cliche of a question, which was, hey, if you've got one bit of advice to offer out um, to a budding developer or a budding designer, what would it be? 
Sintas being Sintas, of course, came back with two points for me. All right. Uh, two, two things. So sure. one is that um, when I started off, I had the realization that like, I want to do this more than just once because I know a lot of game designers who are just like, yeah, I had this idea. I want to make a game about cats and gladiators. And they like go out, do that idea, publish it, and then they're done. And that's like their whole game design career. And that's fine. And you should totally do it if that's what you want to do. Um, other game designers know that they want to do this in the long term. And to them, I recommend spending a little bit of time in the beginning studying and practicing and like just absorbing information. So, so by doing that, because you know you're going to be doing it for 5 or 10 or 15 or your entire life. Um, it helps to have that knowledge early because that way you can lean on it and then use it to make all of your games in the future. All of your games are going to be slightly better as a result of spending maybe, I don't know, three months, six months, a year, just like reading articles and watching videos and stuff like that. And like not trying to make your masterpiece right away, but kind of like setting yourself up to make your masterpiece later. Um, a lot of designers... Uh, especially early on, will overvalue the idea. I remember how before I mentioned that ideas are cheap. Right. Um, so the like, the ideas are cheap. Execution of the idea is expensive. Like having the idea for an Apple iPod, cheap. Making Apple iPod, expensive. very expensive. Sure. So what I'm trying to say is that um, personally, when I work with an idea, I don't become too attached to it. Like I'll have an idea. I'll put it out there, I'll see if it works, and if it's good, keep working, if it's bad, I drop it. And because ideas are like free-flowing and forthcoming for me, and I'm imagining for a lot of people, like I'm not at a loss when one idea goes through. All it means is that now I have more time to work on other ideas which might be more fruitful or might, or, or, or might have more potential. Um, I don't see myself necessarily as like owning the game. I see myself personally as like kind of a custodian for that idea because there are other people who might like if you weren't here making that game, someone else in the future might figure that same game out. Like I've had a couple times like, oh, I'm going to make a game about goblins. They're going to run around a valley. They're going to try to steal gems from each other. And lo and behold, maybe a few hours into researching it, I find that someone else has made that exact game. I never knew about that game, but here it is. It exists already. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that if you don't do it, someone else might. So like, and that's not, that's not bad. That's good. Um, but it means that at any given moment, that idea, which is yours, my idea, I have to protect it and keep it and save it is, is just one of many ideas that any number of us could have had. And the idea is that right now you are, you're the, you're the gardener, you're the cultivator of that idea, but it is not necessarily yours. Someone else could have it. Someone else could use it. And ultimately, games are meant to be shared. So sure. don't become too attached to any one idea. There's a lot of ideas out there. Other people might have that idea and might be able to execute on it better. But at that moment, you're the gardener. You're the one making it try to become the best thing it can be. And that that's valuable. That's important because you're the one doing all that work to make it happen. But don't stress out when one idea falls through. Have another, give it another go. That's more or less my... I my love that. That's a great way to end this little segment, I think. And I think that is a great place to end this video. I, I want to take a couple of minutes out just to say thank you again to Zintas for taking time out to speak with me. Um, the interview process was fantastic. I really enjoyed my time uh, I spent talking with him. He is so inspirational and the interview was Packed, and I mean packed with information, uh, only some of which I've shared with you today. Um, but there will be more coming, I'm sure. Um, for now, though, uh, and before I say goodbye uh, and thank you all for watching, um, I do want to take out a one extra segment uh, from the interview that I saved, which I think captures the philosophy of this channel really well. So as I, as I do all uh, at the end of all videos, I'm going to say goodbye and take care. I'm going to make that little request for that cheeky request for subs and likes, um, especially because we still have plenty of these interviews to come. Um, but also, uh, I am going to end with that little segment now because I think it summed up the philosophy of this channel really well. Take care, YouTube. I think, like as far as as far as my stuff goes, um, I'm on Twitter as uh, Zintis May. Um, I have a, a very tiny YouTube channel where I go through a, a tutorial for card generation templates, but uh, 
I forget what my name is there. You can find it off my Twitter. Um, I'll find it out and make sure it's it's shared. So don't you yeah, worry. It's it's very it's a it, the videos are very bad, but they teach you something, um, and it's a very niche thing. Okay, so, so I want everyone to hone in on that concept, right? Because bad videos with good content is what I'm about at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs>